week. Um, we have so many graduating honor students, 19 people this semester, that um, what was normally a, a one day thing has uh, turned into a four day thing so we can fit everybody in and, and uh, give everyone a chance to talk about their wonderful projects. So thank you all for coming today and thank you all for your various kinds of support for our honor students and the honors program. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. So we do have three presenters today. We have uh, Sarah Archambault, Sarah Hinkape, and Emily Hewling. Um, they will each be presenting for approximately 10 minutes each, um, one after the other. And then once all three are done presenting, um, you, our audience members, will have a chance to interact with them, uh, ask your questions, uh, make comments, et cetera. Um, you can raise your hand or put something in the chat, and Lisa and I will be uh, monitoring that. Um, as I mentioned, we will be recording the session and uh, it will be posted up on the Honor Showcase page at a later date. Um, and in um, what I hope will be our new Honors Program um, electronic archives, but that's a work in progress. Okay. Uh, some of our students were not able to present live this week, but we do have, I believe, four or five of their uh, pre recorded sessions already on that Honor Showcase page if you ever want to take a look. Okay. So that is our housekeeping. Um, thank you all. And I think we will get started. So first, I would like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Sarah Archambault. And Sarah, whenever you are ready, you can go ahead. All right, hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming. As Denise has mentioned, my name is Sarah Archambault. And my project takes a look on how COVID-19 has affected food insecurity. Next slide, please. So I wanna quickly go over um, a brief project overview and I'll dive right into my methodology of research. So for this project, I used a mix of primary and secondary sources. And this mix allowed me to study the issue of food security at different levels. So as we see in a little bit, my secondary sources allowed me to um, study this at the national, state and county level. And then for my primary resources, I volunteered at a couple of organizations and distributed surveys. And that allowed me to get a better sense of how we've been affected at the community level. So with this, this I've um, taken a three-part approach to my project, where in part one, I share the research I've done from my secondary sources. Um, part two will show the research I've done from my primary sources, and it kind of breaks down the results of my survey. And part three will be my project deliverable, which is essentially a brochure that just kind of lists resources available for anyone who's struggling with food insecurity. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we can dive into all the fun stats. And before I do that, I just wanna quickly uh, mention the definition of food insecurity. And food insecurity is defined as not having reliable access to enough affordable, nutritious food to support an active and healthy lifestyle. So with that defined, I would like to draw your attention to the bar chart on the left. For this chart, I analyzed like three years worth of data and I color coded it um, to break it down into different levels. So we start at the national level. And we see that in 2018, 11.1% of households are um, food insecure. But in 2019, that dipped down to like 10%, a little over, these are rough values, but, um, and then in 2020, it spiked up. And this spike, I call the COVID spike because naturally it spiked due to COVID. And then at the state level, again, we see in 2018, 8.9% were food insecure. And then in 2019, that dipped down to 8.2, I believe. The numbers are a little blurry for me, I apologize. But, and then again, in 2020, it spiked up with the COVID spike. Um, the county level follows a very similar trend. I guess, well, it's a lot less. In 2018, it was 9.9% .9 of um, counties in Massachusetts struggling with food insecurity. It dipped down to 9.8 in 2019 and then spiked up to 11.6%. And so this is just the trend. And we've seen this trend, like I've only included three years worth of data. Prior to COVID, we have seen a downward trend with food insecurity levels. And I also wanted to include some fun facts to keep this kind of light. But then I quickly realized that when it comes to food insecurity, there really aren't no fun facts. This is just a very serious issue. So instead I included some not so fun facts. And again, I broke it down by level. So at the national level, we've seen a steady decline in food insecurity rates over the past decade, as I mentioned. But unfortunately, and as we've seen in the graph, COVID came and caused a bunch of these spikes. So that kind of ruined all our efforts. And we were actually at an all-time low in like the past 10 years. We had reached an all-time low, 
But with these spikes, it's going to take a long, like several years to recover and even reach a new low. And then at the state level, when compared to the national average, food insecurity rates in Massachusetts are actually below average. And while this might at the beginning sound great, this still means that about one in 11 people in Massachusetts are struggling with hunger. And that's not a good number, especially when you consider the fact that our current population in Massachusetts is estimated to be 7.1 million. So that's, that's a lot of people struggling with hunger. And then lastly, we have at the county level. So out of the 14 counties in Massachusetts, Bristol County has the third highest rate of food insecurity. Um, and this is not just due to COVID. This has been a trend over um, several years pre-COVID. We just had higher rates than the rest of the counties. Next slide, please. So we've seen these spikes in COVID. Um, and I wanted to take a look at what the response has been at different levels as well. So at the national level, among a few things that a few responses they had. One was to pass the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, this increased SNAP benefits. So people who were receiving SNAPs um, received higher amounts. It also re um, eased the requirements. So more people, more people could apply for SNAP and those who had it could maintain it easier. Um, it also um, increased the ability to use SNAP benefits online previous to COVID. This was in pilot, but once COVID hit, they actually put it out there and all states adopted it. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and they also in introduced um, PEBT, which is essentially um, just provides additional funds to help families with children buy food during the pandemic. At the state level, Massachusetts has um, created a food security task force. Um, they did this because of the increased demand for food assistance across the state. And essentially this task force just kind of makes sure that everyone's needs are being addressed during COVID-19, especially those who are food insecure. Um, and then at the county level, so the response essentially at the county level was to increase resources and services to fight food insecurities. So we've seen tons of pop-up food pantries come up across town and the food pantries that are here have increased their services. And in some cases, they also offered emergency funding. We've also seen tons of schools be used as meal sites. So these were schools that were closed because they couldn't have in-person classes, but they still use their parking lots to have a grab and go style meal distribution. Um, next slide, please. So this is to part two of my project where um, I see firsthand how we've been affected at the community level. Um, these are two of the organizations that I've volunteered at um, in New Bedford and Fall River. So a little about them in New Bedford, I volunteered at Mercy Meals and More. They occur um, six days a week and they're like a, deck, a breakfast program. So they provide a hot to go breakfast every morning, um, Monday through Saturday, they don't do Sundays. Um, their meal options are more or less set. They have a menu with like four to five different things. So eggs, hash brown, waffles, and the people who come in can choose. Um, their service is open to everybody. Um, you just walk in and you can grab a thing, no questions asked. And then the next one is the Bristol Mobile Food Market, which if you know is in Fall River. This one occurs monthly and it prov provides free fresh fruits, vegetables, dairy, and non-perishable food items. The food items do vary greatly. It kind of just depends on what we get from the food bank. Um, and this service is open to Bristol students, faculty, staff, and community members, but you have to pre-register um, if you want to pick up groceries. Next slide, please. Okay, so I know this slide is super packed, it's really heavy on the eyes, but my survey responses were very heavy. So please just bear with me for a minute as I kind of walk you guys through this. And just as a side note, the, these points are not um, organized in any particular order. It's just how I organize them. So my, in the survey that I distributed to my participants, I had two sections. Um, section one asked questions about how COVID-19 has affected individuals regarding food insecurity. And so one of the first things that people mentioned was that there's a loss of jobs. So households that let's say had two sources of income dropped down to one source and then now they're living paycheck to paycheck or in worst case scenario, they lost both sources of income and I mean, both sources um, of income yet and now they have no income. So in addition to that, we've seen that there's been an in increase in food prices and this was especially for organic food. So with people having less income and food prices going up, we've seen that healthy food wasn't always accessible to them. And for those who might have still had enough money to buy healthy food, we've seen that it wasn't always available because there are just, there were disruptions to the food chain and supplies. 
So this ultimately led to families having this decision between do I buy healthy food or do I buy cheap food? Another thing that a lot of participants mentioned that is that everybody is home and because everyone's home, they're eating a lot more food. And to think about it, you have everyone working from home, everyone studying from home. So students who would normally go to school and eat, they're now at home. And then you mix that with people who might just be bored eating or stress eating. But the bottom line is there's a lot more food that's being consumed. And again, you mix that with not having a lot, um, enough income and increased food prices, and it kind of creates this problem. And then in terms of accessing these like food distribution programs or services, people mentioned that there are transportation issues because you know not everyone has reliable transportation. Not everyone might have a car or be able to drive and the bus system isn't the most reliable or easy um, uh, mode of transportation. And building on that, these services are more inaccessible to the elderly and handicapped population. Um, elderly people might just be fearful of going out. That's why they're not coming. Um, they might just not be able to drive. Also, they knew the food delivered, but they're also probably not tech savvy enough to order food online or look up a lot of these stuff. And bus is not an option for them because you think about some places handing up to like 40 pounds of groceries, they can't carry that on a bus. So that was for the first part. And then the second part of my survey kind of asked questions about government assistance and reliance on food distribution programs slash organizations. And so for this part, a mix of participants stated that they received SNAP benefits. Um, prior to the pandemic, many of them didn't have to reply in multiple um, services to fight in food insecurity. Basically, whatever they brought home in income or SNAP benefits kind of got them through. However, since COVID, many of the participants stated that they found themselves in need of additional or even multiple services to combat food insecurity. And participants that, who stated that they didn't receive SNAP benefits or any other government assistance, they mentioned it was because of the stigma around it. So some people, you know, they might have a hard time accepting they need help. Or in some cases, one participant mentioned it's because of pride. So they might be eligible for SNAP benefits, but they're not taking advantage of it. But even with that said, a lot of them have still said that they've noticed more of their friends and colleagues are experiencing food insecurity. So there's this general rise that we just keep seeing is the theme. Um, lastly, I included this quote. This is a participant's response to one of the questions. I just took it straight out. And they said, I rely on food pantry, something I've never had to do before. And I included this because I think it kind of just speaks to the severity of the issue and how badly COVID has affected food insecurity across like every level from the county to the state. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this one's a lot more easier in the eyes, back to the minimal theme, but um, this was for the part, the survey that I distributed to facilitators. Um, and to clarify, facilitators include um, directors, assistants, or volunteers who run these food distribution programs. So their questions concentrated on how their program or organization was affected by COVID-19 or what they've personally noticed in regards to food insecurity. So obviously the first thing was that they see major changes in the way they operate their programs. They've had to implement and follow COVID guidelines, which in most, if not all cases, meant coming up with a no contact system. Um, so for example, the Bristol Bowman food market, they used to have this client choice style food market where participants would come in and essentially choose what food items they wanted. But with this COVID guidelines that they had to follow, their no contact system led them to develop a um, drive through pickup style of distribution. And in the case of Mercy Meals and More, um, like I said, they're a daily breakfast program. And before COVID, people could come into the building, they could choose what they wanted to eat, kind of cafeteria style. And then they had a little dining area where they could come sit, eat their meal and socialize. But since COVID, they've, they've had to also switch to no contact system. So now we have people just coming at the door grab a pre-packed to-go meal and then they leave. And where they eat is just wherever, I mean, somewhere outside, but we can't necessarily allow them in the building. So implementing all of these guidelines and introducing this no contact system has increased the workload for volunteers. Um, now they have to sanitize common areas, they have to pre back tons of food, and then they have to just comply with all the other CDC recommended guidelines. I um, mean, for organizations that couldn't do that, they did face closure, um, especially in the beginning of COVID, when everything was new and I mean, the guidelines kept changing, many places had to just shut down temporarily as they figured out what does this new no contact system look like so that we, so we can still distribute our food, but keep everyone involved safe. 
So in addition to just these major changes in operations, um, a lot of organizations have seen a decrease in volunteers. If you look at almost any organization, it's basically guaranteed that they mention they're looking for volunteers. Um, the decrease may be just due to volunteers afraid of getting COVID or volunteers living with immunocompromised family members and just not wanting to chance it. But whatever the reason is, it is valid. Um, but nonetheless, these programs are mostly volunteer run, so they do heavily depend on having enough volunteers to kind of get the job done. Um, another thing was this, the capacity limit. So for organizations that operated indoors and they can't afford to move operations outdoors, such as Mercy Mills and more, they face capacity limits. You know, you have to have volunteers stand six feet apart. So if you have a small space, you're kind of limited to how many volunteers you can have inside at once. And if this increased workload mixed with the decreased uh, volunteers wasn't enough, um, these organizations have also seen an increase in participants. So in some cases, this means that you have an increased workload with less volunteers. Furthermore, there was some indication that participants needed more assistance, um, whether that was just um, some need for personal hygiene items or pet food or other things. There just was, it was clear that there was a greater need for more than just food. And then for these last two points, my survey questions were centered around what does the community need to do or know about food insecurity? Um, and for one, we need to increase access to services and information. This could be as simple as just spreading the word about the available resources that are out there, um, letting people know what help there is and what services maybe can help them through the process of, let's say, applying for SNAP benefits or who is eligible. And then, um, we also need to work on decreasing the stigma around receiving government assistance. And in terms of what that looks like, that's a whole different story and even possibly a whole different project idea. <laughs> Next slide, please. So now I kind of just want to start wrapping it up with a few kind of final thoughts and reflections. Um, my project, although it seemed broad to me, has really only just scratched the surface of food insecurity. There's so many aspects that I didn't even touch on. So for example, I didn't talk about demographics. I didn't talk about households with children versus households without children, or even talk about general food insecurity um, versus very low rates of food insecurity. So there's so many variables and so many factors that affect all of these rates. Um, some demographics are disproportionately affected. Um, and if you look at statistics, households that have children tend to have higher rates of food insecurity than households without children. Um, and then like the list just goes on, but these different factors always change these rates. By doing this project, it kind of showed me how deep the issue of food insecurity is. So I generally always knew that food insecurity was an issue in these communities. I've seen it around, but I never knew the stats and I never looked, I mean, I never looked into it or take, took the time to research it. Um, once I did start re researching it for this project, it was just, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a rabbit hole. <laughs> and I'm not gonna lie, there were times where I was just like super overwhelmed and I was asking myself, why did I choose this topic? Why is my scope so broad? Although, as I said, it was not broad at all. But, you know, it was just kind of heavy because some of the things I read was so disheartening. But then with that said, completing this project has also been super insightful and I've learned so much and kind of developed a new perspective that I wouldn't have if I didn't do this project. And when I wasn't stressed or overwhelmed, <laughs> it was actually pretty cool to see how like there's a trickle down effect from the highest level to the lowest level and to see how each part of my project supported and connected with one, in one another. So like seeing all of these little connections and just making these kind of realizations, that was a pretty cool thing for me and very eye opening. And lastly, I just want to mention something interesting that my faculty mentor brought up when I was doing a walkthrough with her. So I talked about the spike in influence food insecurity levels and what that response was. And she kind of pointed out that at the higher levels, like at the national and at the state level, the response is more or less, it kind of just throws some money at it. <laughs> and you know, while that's definitely helpful to have more money, that's not a very comprehensive or a complete solution by any means. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these programs that fight food insecurity are dependent on volunteers. So while that financial support is great, when we come down to the community level, we see that what we also need is manpower. So we do definitely need something, a more comprehensive kind of approach to this and a more complete response that'll kind of attack it at different levels. Next slide, please. So this leads me into part three of my project, which is my project deliverable. Um, it's a brochure, which is double-sided. 
This first slide just lists um, resources that are in the Fall River area. It's food pantries and a couple places where people can get some grab and go meals. And then next slide, please. This is the other side, and this is um, locations around New Bedford because I was concentrating on New Bedford and Fall River communities, and that's why I did or um, volunteer organizations in each one. So this is another list of resources. And next slide, please. So yeah, that wraps it up. I want to thank everyone for coming here and for just supporting all of the honors students throughout this week. Um, I also want to give some special thanks to my faculty mentor, Jennifer Deckers, for all the support and feedback she's given me throughout the project. Um, to Professor Denise DiMarzio, just guiding us through the semester, getting us through everything and the IRB process, <laughs> which everyone, all students know that's tough. And then just to the folks at Student and Family Engagement for all their feedback and help with certain aspects of my product, on my project, sorry. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments, I would love to hear them after the classmates are finished with their projects. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, several students decided to um, look at how COVID has impacted various uh, aspects of our of our world and uh, you know great example of, of another project that really looks at an important angle so thank you so much okay so now we will move on to um, Sarah Hincape who has our next presentation so Sarah H whenever you are ready please go ahead Sorry, just realized I was um, still muted, so one second. <laughs> okay, and can everybody see the screen? Yes, you're okay. good. Okay. All right, so hi everyone and welcome and thank you for being here today. My name is Sarah Hincapi and over the semester I worked on a firefighting BOBOT, uh, BOE standing for Board of Education. And this is from concept to prototype. And here is a quick presentation overview to serve as a guide. So these are sections that would appear in EGR 299 in engineering projects class, which I always highly recommend to the engineering students. And I mainly chose this project because of my love for robotics. It combines multiple areas of engineering like uh, mechanical engineering, electronics and coding. And here's my problem statement. Um, it's too much tech. I'm not going to read it out loud. Uh, instead, I'm actually going to show it in graphic form in the following slides. And basically what a problem statement is, it defines a problem. And that's what we're finding the solution for. So I used a Gantt chart, which is a tool for um, kind of like a graphical way of meeting the time requirements and then seeing how everything relates to one another. And now I'm going to get into the background research and statistics. So the next couple of slides are going to show national and state statistics of various fires. Uh, I wanted to highlight that in 2019, we had 481,000 fires at the national level, resulting in around 3,000 civilian deaths, almost 14,000 injuries, and a total of 12 billion in losses. And firefighters alongside civilians perish every year in the fires, mainly due to getting lost. Um, and the dangerous conditions within the buildings. Again, in 2019, there was a total of 48 firefighter deaths, 10 that happened inside of the structures, and 23,000 injuries among firefighters within those structure fires. And um, this project focuses more on extinguishing a fire within a building, not so much outside, so that's why I wanted to focus on that aspect of the statistics. And over the years, uh, we have seen a decline in fire incidents, and there's many reasons behind it um, that are listed here on this, uh, this slide. So uh, buildings being built to code, resistant materials, but um, there's still a threat that fires pose to health and safety. So in looking for possible solutions, I was thinking of autonomous robots, and you have two a few robotics applications, um, two of them on ground. One of them, a great example is a extinguishing robot that was used in Notre Dame. And then in Dubai, you have firefighting drones for use with tall skyscrapers. And there's different methods of putting out a fire. Here are the phone main ones. And I mostly focused on cooling and starving. 
which for all my May babies, happy birthday. And you do this every single year. Um, when you blow out those candles, you're cooling and starving that fire. And replicating that on the robot, I decided to use a fan. And uh, I just want to highlight that the fan works at a smaller scale, but it's not what you would use at a larger scale. Uh, for my research, my mechanicals and hardware, I used DC motors for the process of running the fan and blowing out the candle and to provide the motion for the robot. And then for navigation, um, there's a whole different selection of sensors that you can use for navigation, but I mainly focused on uh, infrared LEDs and the receiver. And then for my electricals, because my robot, um, the output, it can only output five volts of voltage and it needs a, the fan needs 12 volts. So I ended up using what's called a, a MOSFET. Um, and MOSFET was ended up being more compatible with the microcontroller and the power requirements. So what the heck is a MOSFET? Um, Cause it, it does get very technical, but basically it's like a switch. And a great example is to think of it as a spigot outside of your house. So a MOSFET will use volt, voltage or pressure to provide the water current flow. And you have your, your source, so the water container, you have your gate, which is going to be the water valve, um, the drain spilling out into the ground. And then you can think of the pipe as the wire, just to give a, 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 an easier analogy of uh, what the MOSFET's doing. And then this image shows how selecting the appropriate switches and, or the MOSFETs determines the direction of rotation inside of the motor. So you get your clockwise and counterclockwise rotations. But if you turn on the wrong switches, so you do have to be careful, uh, you could cause a short or a fire. We don't want that. That's the purpose of this project. We're extinguishing a fire, not creating fires. Um, and then you have a great example of a final MOSFET circuit with full protection to the microcontroller. My sensor research, um, this is just a visual showing the various temperatures and wavelengths of light sources. And I mainly focus on the wavelength of a candle uh, where the green boxes are. That's what we want to look for in a sensor. And the first kind of sensor I researched was a temperature sensor. You have contact sensors such as meat thermostats when you're cooking and non-contact, which everybody, I guarantee you in this room right now, um, has come across the non-contact, like the thermal guns, the ones that we've been using um, throughout the COVID pandemic before entering a building, and UV sensors. So we didn't use this for the project, um, and it detects light at the opposite end of the, uh, the spectrum. Everything emits UV, but you do get false alarms with uh, these kinds of sensors and interruption from ambient light. So if I had another light open or the window uh, and the robot's trying to detect um, the fire in the room, it's not gonna be very easy. And I decided on a dedicated flame sensor, which is um, in the infrared wave spectrum of the candlelight. So it just meets that criteria. And for my decision process, uh, as you can see, I had four problems to solve and I used a tool, used in engineering called the decision matrix to solve each problem. As an example, um, extinguishing a fire. And basically you brainstorm different possibilities. You assign a weight to the specifications and the highest score will show the best solution. So as you see in the pictures, for those of you that grew up with fairly odd parents when you were little, throwing rocks at a fire was a great solution for them in that particular episode. But, uh, and I could make a robot that throws rocks at a fire not the best method in this case. Um, and decidedly the fan was the best choice for this case. Another way um, that I use the matrix was to decide the microcontroller and what a microcontroller is on a robot. Uh, it's just basically the brain. So I had the choice between a basic scan, which is um, decidedly what was used, an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi. And then for my design, these are just two of the original designs that I had in mind. The first one on the left, the fan was behind the robot. It wasn't actually gonna be connected to the robot. It was just going to be a prototype, non-functional. And the robot was going to spin 180 degrees once it detected the fire, 
turn on the fan, um, well, the LED in this case, but once I got the MOSFET, that gave me, it just opened up more room for uh, adding that fan on there, actually making it functional. And I used a much smaller fan. So it ended up turning into a, a little mouth on the robot. And then the sensor uh, kind of looks like a nose on it. So it, it, it's like a cute little creature of its own. So the general circuit idea, this is a quick flow chart. Uh, starting from the power sources, the batteries, then expanding into components like the sensors and the DC motors that are currently on my board. So again, a, a quick overview of it. Um, these are the three circuits that I used on the robot for navigation and fire extinguishing. And then for the coding and, and software design, uh, we like to use flowcharts to kind of sketch out the code. So that's what these are here for. And this is my actual code. Um, following that flow chart and the main program consists of subroutines. These being the subroutines that are called out by the code and then on the right I have the happy birthday code for um, when it's singing. The specifications of the microcontroller, a general overview of all the materials that were used along with the extras that were necessary for this and my workstation. I used an ESD mat and a bracelet to ground myself to protect the components. Here I am installing the batteries and the motors on the robot, uh, the navigation and the MOSFET. And finally, I added the fire sensor and there's the final robot. So for testing, I tested all the electricals uh, on a simulator and a multimeter. And then I verified that the robot followed its programming sequence, uh, which I am going to show right now. So first, Part of the criteria locating the fire, I added a the robot sings happy birthday. So happy birthday to everyone from May. And now it's turning on the fans uh, for the cooling and smothering method. And once it determines that the fire has been extinguished, the robot backs away from the fire. Getting back to the presentation. Um, and at the very end of the day, uh, it ended up being a very economical solution, just $194. There were some budget limitations, um, which we ended up having to use weaker sensors. So the fire had to be extremely close to the robot. Uh, had some interference from the light sources. Again, it's a lower end sensor. So it, um, it is more susceptible to that interference. And I used a nine volt battery on a 12 volt fan. So that meant I'm not really utilizing the full capacity or the power of the fan. Uh, for future improvements, because we always want to improve, um, making the nine volt battery more accessible or eventually actually using the 12 volt battery that the fan needed. That way the fire can be extinguished faster. Uh, my prototype is small. It is smaller than my cat. Um, so it can only handle a candlelight fire. In real life, um, like you can see the other robot for the Notre Dame standing next to the two men, it's um, three feet by four feet by two feet. And eventually I want to add other sensors. So carbon monoxide, radiation, a camera and a remote control so that in case you need to take action, um, you can take over for it afterwards. Uh, my work cited for the experiment. And I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. And then some acknowledgments to Professor Dr. Michael Myers for overseeing the project, Denise DiMercio for her guidance in the honors program, and then the Commonwealth Honors Program for this opportunity. And again, uh, I'll, I will also take uh, questions and answers at the end uh, after everybody presents. Sarah, thank you so much. Uh, I love your charming little robot and that it sings happy birthday while it blows out the candle. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and I just learned about 50 new words that are not part of my everyday vocabulary. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. And um, finally, today we have our last presenter, Emily Hewling. Whenever you are ready, go right ahead. Thank you so much, Denise. Hello, everyone. As Denise said, my name is Emily Hewling, and this project that I'm doing for the Honors Curriculum has focused on drawing parallels between history, fashion, textiles, and sustainability 
and then using my own experience in making a skirt as a practical application of this newfound knowledge. Next slide, please. I mainly chose to do this project because of my interest in fashion and art. As a result of this interest and through my findings as I start to make my own clothing, I discovered that the fast fashion industry is one of the most destructive in the world directly after oil and gas. The question that really remains to be, what are we as a society doing to change this? Ultimately, this project identifies the need to inform our communities of the impacts of fast fashion and ultimately implement the solution to fast fashion impacts. The reality of the situation is that unless a large population of people are informed and protect against the industry, then it will continue to grow. Individuals need to come together to tackle the problem. Next slide, please. Historically speaking, fabric was extremely precious. We don't regard fabric with the same mentality as we used to 200 years ago, but the same can be said of many of the things that we think of in modern day. Uh, we don't regard many things with the same mentality we used to 200 years ago. Take muslin fabric. Muslin fabric 200 years ago was a real and very, very valuable fabric. Specifically, we'll be looking at what is called Dhaka muslin. It was nicknamed Baft Hawa, which was a nod to the fabric's very breathtaking and ethereal quality, with Baft Hawa literally meaning woven air. With a thread count of 1,400 on average, this fabric was the finest quality that the late 18th century and the 19th century had to offer, and it definitely had a price to match. For context, the highest thread count muslin cloth today has received is approximately 300. Um, to compare this to something that you might know uh, in your daily life, think of thread counts on sheets. Uh, when you go to Target perhaps to buy some, you'll see that the highest you can generally get to is 600 and those are extremely soft, yes. So think 1,400 thread count on average. That's how extremely fine and beautiful this fabric was. Next slide, please. Now we can take a look at muslin fabric today. I do have a sample with me uh, that you can't feel with you, unfortunately, but you can see um, Daco muslin was actually so fine that it was transparent. You can see that's definitely not the case here, but it's scratchy and it's used as a scrap fabric to test, fabric, to test patterns before making an actual garment. It's commonly referred to as a throwaway fabric. While Dhaka muslin was so fine, I'll demo this for you here, a bolt of it could be pulled through a ring. Modern day fabric is not nearly as close as quality. Um, for context, a bolt of Dhaka muslin was approximately 60 inches wide and 80 yards long. That is a lot of fabric. This is approximately 42 inches wide and 60 inches long. You, you can't pull this through a ring. It's very thick, it's bulky, it's not the same. <laughs> um, the fabric differs quite a lot in quality. So using the demonstration that I just gave you, we can conclude that Dhaka muslin definitely has no rival in modern day textiles, but of course the same can be said of many ancient textiles due to the artisan techniques used to create the fabric. Next slide, please. Continuing on our theme of modern day, the fashion industry is one of the largest in the world, but it also accounts for 10% of all global carbon emissions, while textile dyeing is responsible for being the second largest polluter of the world's water supply. According to an article by Scott Castle, 83% of used textiles are disposed in the garbage, even though a majority of these items can be donated for reuse and recycling. This comes down to the idea that much of our clothing today, due to the development of gas and oil industry, is actually made of plastic fibers. Um, if you truly think about the plastic that we tend to recycle, clothing is that very same material, just spun into very thin threads and then woven from there. So clothing is actually highly recyclable and we do have thrift stores today that you can donate to. So this is what Castle is referring to in the statement. The fast fashion industry perpetuates the idea that clothing is temporary and disposable and that it lacks value. This is the key to their business model and how they continue to function. Next slide, please. So how do we go about saving the environment from the second largest polluter in the world? Fact of the matter is it all starts with a shift in perspective. Let's go back approximately five seconds to when I said the fast fashion industry perpetuates the idea that clothing is temporary and disposable and that it lacks value. This is the key to their business model. This very phrase conceals the solution. To destroy this industry polluter, we need to change our perception of clothing. Clothing is permanent and valuable. The remaining question is how do we teach ourselves this? Next slide, please. 
I taught myself this concept through a practical application of this knowledge, a project where I designed and constructed my own skirt. Approximately 25 hours of labor for a single garment where I spent time and money in sourcing sustainable and ethically made materials. I don't look at this skirt or treat it like I do the rest of my store-bought clothes. I take great care in washing it, I inspect it often, and I adore it quite a lot for it being made to perfectly suit my measurements. Already my brain has detected a change in the perceived value of this article of clothing, simply because I took the time to make one garment, just one. Our experiences shape and define our opinions of things. It's important to never deny ourselves of the opportunity to grow in this manner. Next slide, please. So further discussion. This slide exists solely as a means for me to prompt you into thinking about a few different ideas and just the different aspects that you can look at this problem. First and foremost, it is ignorant to pretend that this issue is simple. It's a multifaceted and complex problem that will take years, if not decades, to fix. You can approach this issue from so many different standpoints. You can take the economic standpoint via the state of the global economy and what people can afford to buy in terms of clothes. You can take a political standpoint where the USA is based on capitalism, and therefore this country like quite literally runs on the art of consumerism. This is a mentality that you genuinely can't escape from unless change starts to happen on a larger level. You can take the education standpoint. Perhaps the reason we look at clothing the way we do has something to do with the removal of home economics classes from schools or the fact that education is often based on regurgitating and memorizing information, as opposed to teaching tools to think for yourself. It will always come back to education as an argument. Most arguments do come back to that point. And we can conclude from here that the shift in perspective must also begin in education. These things need to begin young. That is the general conclusion when you teach perspective because it perspective is taught. To reference Sir Thomas More's utopia, for if you suffer your people to be ill-educated and their manners to be corrupted from their infancy and then punish them for those crimes to which their first education disposed them, what else is to be concluded from this but that you first make thieves and then punish them? In other words, education is a tool with which you may arm yourself against ignorance and is a door to countless opportunities. You can't hold someone accountable to what they were never taught, and though the blame lies with the companies that consciously exploit labor and destroy the environment, consumers must also claim responsibility for any ignorance. Though this ignorance is hardly ever intentional, it becomes malicious at the cost of both people and the environment. Take Orwell's 1984, where the main character Winston thinks to himself, if there was hope, it must lie in the proles, because only there in those swarming disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania could use the force to destroy the party ever be generated. Orwell further writes that despite the power of the proles, they have no reason to change the status quo. As Orwell puts it in the book, they were beneath suspicion. As the party slogan put it, proles and animals are free. Orwell here is referring to the fact that proles are free because rather like animals, they are distracted, lustful, and happy. This goes back to the idea that the fast fashion industry perpetuates these ideas. And oftentimes what happens with industry is they keep people pitted against one another to keep the attention off of the real issue, which creates no desire to solve the root problem. We as consumers hold the responsibility of ensuring awareness of where our products come from, lest we become ignorant of the power that we hold. After all, consumerism is based on consumers, is it not? The industry itself is reliant on this lack of education and this lack of action on the part of the population in order to function. In fact, this is the key to their business model, as I stated earlier, or any consumer-based business model. Should we continue to buy from these companies? It sends a message saying that you're content with their actions, no matter your intentions or values as a consumer. So now that I've brought up I, these ideas, I encourage you to think about the issue and the complexities that lie with it. Perhaps it's time to petition to bring back home economics classes or become stronger advocates for education and the art of thinking for yourself. I'll allow you to think these ideas over while looking at the product of this project. So my deliverable, my deliverable. Next slide, please. So here are some photos of the skirt and the component I used to make the repeat pattern. I also have a brief process photo in which I am doing some gathers. Um, if you'd like to take a look and examine these for a moment, I thank you so much for your time. Um, I'd also like to give a special thank you to the unseen hands behind this project. Lisa, Denise, Kat, and even fellow students were all involved in this creation. I asked for their feedback. They were all extraordinarily helpful and I am eternally thankful for them. Their guidance was absolutely necessary for the completion of this project. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Emily. Um, and to all our presenters, thank you so much. Eye-opening, all different angles, just uh, really a, a great example of 
um, the avenues that uh, students in our program uh, travel down um, based on their, their personal interests, their majors, et cetera, um, and all just incredible. So um, we do have about 15 minutes um, for audience questions and comments. Um, please feel free to use the raise your hand uh, feature um, or use the chat box and we'll go from there. So, so uh, please, after you folks. Uh, Bob Brack, go ahead. I had just a comment with uh, Sarah Archibald's project. And I, I think a one thing that she said that was so important that she learned from this was when she said about, well, I know I could enter going down a rabbit hole on this, but I think that's an incredible insight that how complex this issue is. And I think we need more people going down that rabbit hole and uh, finding out what's what's going on because it, it, it's just a terrible thing when you see uh, this is uh, where the uh, greatest country in the world and the most the richest country in the world and yet we have all these people some people at the point of starving and stuff in the country and starving not necessarily from uh, lack of food but lack of healthy food you know and and i think that's another key to the uh, insecurity issue where you know yeah you can go to mcdonald's and get something for a buck and everything but you know what, what does it give you you know when uh and and so i think i think it's important you know with uh you know community uh, like gardens and things like that and i know my parish is just starting a community garden uh so and it's right in the center of city of fall river at the uh, cathedral they're going to create a large community garden there for their, for the, you mentioned uh, uh, one of the things was the Pope Francis location and one of your things. And so it was to provide food for that uh, area there. So thank you for your work on that. It's. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Other folks, comments, questions. Is that uh, Kat, are you raising your hand? Yeah, please go ahead, Kat. You're on uh, right now, there yes. you go. Uh, I had a couple of comments, um, one for Sarah A. Um, I loved the, you were presenting very intricate um, aspects of problem details, solution-based approaches and strategies that were happening. And you were talking about in one of your slides where it was about a problem between, I think it was a distribution problem. Um, there were a decrease in the volunteers, but an increase in the participants. Um, and I thought that would be an example of an area of where um, information illustration or data visualization would be super, super helpful to get those really, really important components um, across. Um, because sometimes there, there's a direct correlation there perhaps because of what's going on with COVID that I don't think people would really get a chance to understand and see as well with the words alone, the text alone. Um, and so uh, there's a whole field of like data visualization and illustration that would probably, uh, same thing with you, um, Sarah H, like uh, the data visualization field is very, very helpful in taking things that are very difficult to deliver in a quick amount of time with words or pictures. And it, and it correlates variables that you're really trying to show a uh, relationship and dynamics between. Thank you, Kat. Uh, Bob? Yep, I have a thing for Sarah H. And uh, I think one thing that, that she brought out and presented uh, was the complexity of the engineering process that goes into designing something and how you have to go through all these logical steps like to come out with your final project and how you have to look at different alternatives and things like that to finally come up with. And it's, a, it's an incredible thing on critical thinking. Also, when we're trying to, to get our students to uh, critical thinking on these, and it's, a, it's a quite, a, a, quite a project that you did there, Sarah. And uh, you know, I appreciate what all that you went through on that. Sure. And I also had one other quick thing about uh, with Emily. <laughs> I worked in uh, one, one comment she made about the uh, dyes 
and polluting the water. I, I worked for 11 and a half years as the laboratory director at the Fall River Wastewater Treatment Plant. So I used to see what came in, 20 million gallons a day or more coming through there. And uh, during the times when the textile industry in the city of Fall River were operational, you know, a lot of them have, have closed down and all, but early on when, when they were really going, you know, you would see the color of the wastewater coming into the plant change on an hourly basis, depending on the dyes that were discharged into the water. And uh, so it was, uh, you know, it, it did make a, a com even though a little dye goes a long way, it's, uh, it still made, you know, to, in order to change 20 million gallons, uh, the colors like, you know, almost like turning on switches and things like that is, is quite a, quite a thing when you would, you would see that. So thank you for your work, Emily, too. Thanks, Bob. Something Bob said just uh, made me think about um, for all three of our presenters today and their, their widely various uh, topics. Uh, the thing that I think they all show is that, um, you know, in, in our current culture, we, we've gotten to a place where it seems like it's so reductive, where there's just little phrases that, um, that are used that uh, mask very complex situations. And as we saw in these, in these, um, brief presentations, how uh, each one of these things is so complex, so layered, uh, so many issues with it, so much work to find solutions and how there's, there's, there's nothing uncomplicated. And uh, just in a few minutes, um, I think each participant really showed us um, the incredible level of thought um, that goes into all of this work. So well done, everyone. Other questions and comments? I actually had a comment for, um, for Emily uh, the, the, that she mentioned fast fashion. I thought that was very interesting. Um, I guess I started my journey uh, um, into minimalism uh, a while back. So I wanted to recommend The Minimalist. Um, they talk more about like having, having more with less, which sounds weird at first, but um, the concept of just having what's enough and what adds meaning to your life, like getting rid of the clutter. Um, but I also wanted to uh, point Emily to a blogger, uh, Gitter Mary Johansson, I believe. Um, she used to be a model working in the fast fashion industry. And um, she does a lot of research and will put it out there, like all the different statistics and data of what fast fashion is doing and then the trends for consumerism, like how it's just negatively impacting um, as not just as a nation, but as a world. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, my microphone is muted. But um, this sort of goes back into the historical mentality. I've done a lot of uh, historical research on clothing, especially for this project. Um, one of the things that we definitely look at differently is just how we use clothing today. Uh, it was not as always readily available in the past. You had to go through a seamstress. They had to buy fabric. It was tailored to your measurements. Clothing was far more expensive because of those things, and you didn't own as much because of how valuable clothing was. Uh, it cost you a lot of money. It was made for you. You kept up with it. If it had holes in it, you would mend it. Um, oftentimes, clothing wouldn't even get to the point of holes in it because people cared for their clothing so much. They would notice that there was a rough patch or this seems a little bit too thin, so they would actually bring it to a seamstress prior to that happening for repairs. Um, also, just it was more of a minimalist mentality without even being a minimalist mentality. Uh, historically, when you had clothes, you didn't own a lot unless you were extremely, extremely rich, aristocracy, nobility sort of thing. That was the only real excuse for having an overwhelming surplus of clothing. Whereas today it's just so readily available to pull off the rack that you don't really think about the purchase anymore. Um, you, you thought about the purchase 200 years ago because that purchase was not a $5 t-shirt. It was a $500 like a uh, blouse sort of thing that you had going on that, that did take a lot of thought. But I appreciate the direction towards the blog and I will totally look into it. Thank you. Bob, was that hand up from before? Yes, yes. I had another a question for Emily. Uh, I was just curious. How did they make that DACA muslin? You know, because it, it it seems like, it, <laughs> you know, you can't go anywhere near there today, you know, with stuff. And yeah. How did they make it then? 
Um, the article I read is actually working on a restoration project to bring back DACA muslin quality. They're starting with a specific cotton that was grown in the Bangladesh Indian area, like that sort of area. They had a specific um, cotton plant that they used. There's also the fact that artisan um, techniques are very, very different from the machinery uh, that we have today in fast fashion. Uh, the rise of technology has kind of negated the artisan techniques, but those techniques are still passed down through generations, sort of like folklore in a way where it goes through families. Um, these threads from what I read is an extremely complicated technique for many people. Um, you have to twist and pull in such a way as not to break the thread, but weave it. And that's where you get the 1,400 thread count. Um, that sort of thing. I couldn't give you the specifics about the process because I am not an artisan weaver, but there are resources out there that are trying to recreate these things and bring them back. It's also worthy of noting that um, artisans are trending actually right now. We're, we're in a sort of place where the fast fashion industry interest is starting to lower and we're getting more people that are interested in artisan made products, clothing, pottery, um, really anything that that's becoming um, more popular if you noticed uh, the trend with thrifting things like this so it's actually we're going down a good road so far go ahead Kat um, I just wanted to like you were talking about this earlier Denise like all of the presenters today like y'all are all talking about very vast complex complicated subject matter and I just want to applaud y'all for taking these very involved, complicated ideas and distilling them down into applicable examples of solution-based thinking. Um, I think all of y'all did such an amazing job in, in like consolidating what seems to be very overwhelming and intimidating into a way that can be not just easily understood, but replicated in a solution type manner. So I think all of y'all did a really great job with that. Agreed, thank you, Kat. <laughs> Anyone else? We have another minute or two before we will close up today. If I can say something, I, I'm definitely amazed by your presentation. I, I'm, I somehow, being part of Bristol, I'm very honored and humble to hear you guys doing this work. That's one side of the, my, my feeling. The other side is uh, from my experience in different uh, cultures, uh, I think that you also can see what is happening, for example, in Latin America, your topic, Emily, is very important in terms of salary, how uh, things work over there, uh, the necessities in terms of textile, uh, all, the, all the things related to labor, for example, is very important to mention. Sarah, both of you also in terms of what does it mean being uh, food scarcity in Latin America, for example, or in, in five workers, um, how they deal with situations in uh, countries where, for example, Lima or Sao Paulo, um, there are millions that you, you have 10 million people in one city that is, is, is smaller than Boston. So these kind of things, you can extend your research. I think you will have some ideas, resources, and solutions also uh, that you are looking in your topics. Thanks. Thank you, Alejandro. Yes, for our presenters today and, and through all of our, our four days, um, you're making me think, Alejandro. I, I was thinking, wow, you know, all these people could could use their projects going forward to the next school, or even perhaps, you know, onto the PhD. And there's so much to work with. Um, and uh, I, I agree that uh, what Kat said, you know, these complex issues that were brought down to us to give us this taste of something to help us start to dig into these issues. So. Well, it is one o'clock. I don't see any more hands up. So I think we will call it a day. Um, I want to, first of all, of course, thank our honor students here for your awesome work uh, and your presentations. Thank you all so much. Uh, I wanna thank Lisa Noel, um, who, as I mentioned before, she is the, the magic maker behind the curtain. So thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, this is the fourth of our four days of showcases. So uh, I think we've had a great four days. And to all of you in the audience, um, 
many of you I can see by you by who you are. You know, you you offer so much support um, to the honors program um, in one way or another, and it cannot run without a community of support. So. Uh, thank you all. Thanks for taking the, uh, your lunch hour today to spend some time with us and for supporting our honor students. Uh, hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you all so much. I'll ask our three presenters to hang around for another minute. Um, but for the rest of you, thank you. Take care and see you again. Bye bye. <laughs>